Torbjorn, um, what is Bitcoin then? I mean, you talk about sort of trying to examine, you know, what, what Bitcoin is, how it had value back then. And there's been quite a lot of uh, developments, you know, in, in the thinking at least and, and the rhetoric in the, in the space. You know, what, what is Bitcoin to you um, and, and sort of how does it have value? How, how has that changed over, over the last six, seven years you've been in the space? Yeah, so to me, I would define it as a form of money because it is used as such uh, in certain situations. Uh, most critics who claim that it is not money tend to talk about uh, medium of exchange, uh, especially um, unit of account and store of value as if it's something absolute uh, and not related to the context you're in. I much more prefer defining money in terms of moneyness, its ability to buy, and that's uh, obviously dependent on the situation. My Norwegian kroner can buy me anything here in Norway, but it can't buy me, any, but I cannot spend it outside of Norway. Is Norwegian kroner money? Well, obviously. Uh, is Bitcoin used to store value? Of course, it holds value all over time. Is it volatile? Yes, but so is a lot of other currencies. It is used for payment. Yes, we use it ourselves in Arcane to pay freelancers. Uh, working from Nigeria. Uh, I used it to buy beer, uh, not liquidating it first, but actually buying the beer directly. And uh, is it used as a unit of account? Well, not very much uh, for normal uh, commerce, but it is on chain. And to be frank, the unit of account question is not the most important to me. Uh, why does it hold value? Well, uh, at the end of the day, to me, it holds its value because it solves ish problems that other monies cannot solve. Uh, that is both uh, the, uh, in the, its censorship resistance and its absolute scarcity, uh, but also in its ability to transfer value across borders and long distances. It's the only digital bear asset without any counterparty risk. All other forms of money, uh, digital money, is a claim on a counterparty, which means that if you want to transfer money through the banking system, you have to send it through what is called a correspondent banking system, because if I send money to the US, uh, my bank doesn't have a direct relationship with the bank of that merchant. So you have to have a chain of banks successively exchanging claims on each other. You could bypass that by sending a gold bar, but that's very cumbersome. But by sending the Bitcoin, the value is actually moved. And that's ex extremely transformational and to me, extremely powerful. That makes Bitcoin the most powerful kind of collateral asset. Uh, it's the only thing that can deliver real-time settlement or something close to real-time settlement across borders and geographies. Yes, yeah, it's come. A, it's certainly come a long way. It's an interesting point um, about being, you know, the only form of money that doesn't have counterparty risk. And then on the other hand, you know, we're having the sort of institutional trading landscape is coming, uh, moving more in the direction of having this sort of uh, layer two settlement and trading. So. Um, you're not actually holding or trading, you know, the asset yourself. You're just trading a, a sort of digital certificate on that asset, um, because you know they want. Apparently, ten minutes is is too long um, in order to to settle a trade, uh, which you'd have to wait at least, you know, for one block on on Bitcoin and and then six confirmations. So, um, I, I, so I mentioned that. So I think it's very important to realize that in situations where you do have trust, uh, for instance, within a country. Uh, within a trading platform uh, to leverage that and uh, settle your balances on that database uh, is potentially way more efficient than leveraging the trustless Bitcoin blockchain. So However, if you're crossing and non -trust. Borders, yeah, but if you're if you need to cross trust borders, for instance, sending it over long distances to a jurisdiction where your local law doesn't help you at all, then uh, it's well worth using something like Bitcoin. And also with Lightning, you actually see derivatives trading, uh, leveraging Lightning deposits. Uh, I tested it uh, recently. Oh, uh, zooming back out to, um, you know, we talked about the stock to flow earlier, and I noticed, uh, Torb, your, your, your thumb went down, uh, yeah. which we're very pleased about at ByteTree, certainly. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what is it about the stock to flow model that is, um, well, maybe you can give a sort of a brief intro or overview of, of what it is and, and why you think it doesn't really sort of play out? So it is a regression uh, trying to predict the future value of Bitcoin. And as it's regressor or explanatory variable, it's trying to take scarcity. So there's no doubt that uh, Bitcoin derives its value from being scarce and then 
uh, the value has to appreciate when more people demand it. Uh, but the problem I have, uh, there are several issues with this model. Um, one, I don't believe in any models uh, that are kind of that publicly available uh, can predict a future price of a um, highly liquid and traded asset. Uh, because if it were right, the mere fact that the model got uh, known uh, or discovered would change the kind of dynamics in the market so it wouldn't be true anymore. So it's, I find it very strange how a lot of libertarians uh, with a kind of uh, favoring the Austrian school of economics uh, and Austrians tend to not be very f uh, fan of uh, uh, accumulations. And then suddenly with the stock to flow model, uh, they try to do all of the, a lot of different econometric tests to prove its validity. And although a lot of those tests have turned out to not be valid after all, uh, that's not really where the discussion is. The discussion is uh, kind of one step before that, uh, which is the model doesn't account for demand in any way. Uh, and it's very clear to me that uh, Bitcoin's price is primarily demand driven. So I think that uh, scarcity is really important. Uh, the model gets that right. Uh, and then people uh, maybe rightfully think that Bitcoin will appreciate in the future. And then you have this model that mm, kind of give you an excuse for having that belief, and then you build up a cult around it. So it can actually end up being performative or kind of through a reflexivity type of dynamic where people uh, kind of putting a lot of value on the prediction from the stock to flow model behave as if it's true. And then for a period, it can... Uh, turn out to be true. Uh, we've seen this in the market before, especially when Black Skulls was released. The pricing of options uh, was not following the Black Skulls model prior to its existence. After its existence, it had perfect fit for several years. But uh, it's just a mere premise that you can do a regression and predict the future value of an asset uh, with certainty. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Oh, this is music. This is yeah. music to my ears. Would you like my job? Would you like to have an advisory? I mean, I can't make you the founder because we can't change history, but you know, you just put it so well. And I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. It's, it's a big relief, Charlie. Uh, it's something we've talked hours and hours about. And uh, so, okay, um, while we have you, I think another interesting dynamic that we, we spoke about in the run up to this is that, you know, how does the uh, network continue to sustain itself? Um, when the block reward, so we've just had the halving, when the block reward uh, cuts in half. So, you know, minor revenues go from 18 million a day uh, to about 9 million a day uh, at mm. the same price level. So, you know, ha is this going to work? Will, there, will the network remain secure? Um, you know, what's next? What do we think will happen? I think for the indefinite future, it's impossible to say how this will play out. But in the near future, it's not an issue at all. And we have to remember that uh, the cur current uh, subsidy is still a subsidy. So it might actually be the case that we spend uh, too much resources on mining, that the network is too secure. Also, uh, as Paul pointed out in the previous section, uh, prior to the halving, we had uh, exchange rate halving uh, with the uh, same effect on miners. So uh, the exchange rate uh, is much more important for kind of the changes uh, in the mining reward in form of the coin base uh, than the halvings happening every fourth year. Uh, another th in uh, interesting observation is that uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, or at least somewhere back in time, uh, miners actually sometimes produced empty blocks. Uh, they didn't take the hassle of including transactions for the fear of being orphaned, for the block, for being a little bit larger, taking a little bit more time. Uh, and it made sense not to include the transactions if the transaction fees is too, too small a percentage of the total reward. Uh, but right now, I think we've seen uh, fees spiking up to close to 20% of total reward, uh, which means that it is economically nonsensical not to include those transactions. So miners will be more incentivized to include the transactions. And lastly, I think one thing that's really important to understand is that as long as Bitcoin remains the biggest SHA-256 mining blockchain, uh, and we have specialized hardware mining uh, this, uh, that you cannot use for anything else, a lot of the security is derived from that because 
you don't have a lot of computing capacity, you can suddenly hire and, so, uh, and attack the bit between uh, blockchain with. Also, for a lot of transactions, waiting a little bit longer for a little bit more confirmation is not a problem. So if you cut the uh, reward in half, say that kind of naively that would translate into a halving of hash rate, well, wait twice the length uh, and you'll have the same level of security. So, uh, and especially with more uh, off-chain type of transactions, be it lightning or liquid, uh, having a longer waiting period uh, for the closing transaction should not be a big deal. So I, it, I'm not too worried about the question of uh, kind of the viability uh, of the rewards going to miners, uh, at least over the next five years. And uh, we have enough if, if issues to solve uh, in the meantime. Yeah, it's an interesting distinction, isn't it? That um, you know, fees need to increase in order to can like can continue to to keep the incentive um I, I think it's really interesting point that you make about whether the network is is too secure um but you know as we add more layers on top of it sort of layer twos if we have um you know smart contracts on bitcoin or, or digital gold as, as we're going to talk about uh, later in the in the show you know then then we you know we need all the security that we can get and um i think there needs to be this shift T towards a more of a f understanding of a fee market that you're paying for something that is really incredibly secure and decentralized and, and trustless um, and that's a, and that's a real privilege to have space on on the blockchain Would you absolutely agree? absolutely yeah. and but i think it's also really important because people think that if you have an evil major major majority like a 51 percent attack they can do anything to the blockchain they can steal every coin they can rewrite all history but that's very far from the truth. So uh, if they try to rewrite history far back in time, that will be extremely expensive, which means that you'll always, and they cannot steal coins they haven't owned previously. Uh, so in worst case, it just means that you'll have to wait a little bit longer for that super confirmation you want from the on-chain transaction. Okay, that's a really interesting, really interesting perspective. <laughs> Actually. Have you have, have you written anything um, at, in the research division of Arcane that that you could send our viewers to to sort of look into that? Not on fees yet. It's on my to do list, but <laughs> there's a lot on the to do list. But uh, uh, I think, especially around security and mining, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings, and there's also a lot of good blog posts by prominent Bitcoin developers that are not well known, kind of known well enough. It feels like something we uh, we just don't want to take for granted um, because yeah, absolutely, I, I agree. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and it's also very likely that on-chain fees will increase. Uh, we see more and more batching, which means that the cost per single transaction can be low uh, at the same time as you pay a higher total uh, fee, uh, stuff like that. And so last question uh, over to Torb. So uh, the one from the audience from Toby who says, uh, I'm a fan of Bitcoin, but like to consider the opposite or contrarian view. What do you think would make Bitcoin collapse or become irrelevant for any reason? And how likely do you think that is? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Um, I think uh, lack of adoption. Uh, it's a big uh, challenge because uh, if enough people own it, uh, it'll be protected from uh, harsh regulation. And I think that harsh regulation can really stop most of its use. Not 100%. You can push it down to the black market, but it'll make it, I mean, governments can make it very difficult for people to use Bitcoin. Uh, so I think that we, I think we have passed that level, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, for instance, in Norway, around 5% of the adult population owns Bitcoin. Uh, we should push that. You see the same numbers in Canada and in Sweden. You see some higher numbers in some developing countries, but that's amongst those with internet connection. But the more ownership, uh, the less likely it is to be crushed by regulation. And I think that crushing by regulation is a real threat. Uh, of course, there are the potential of technical uh, challenges. Uh, it could be anything from a, an inflation bug to 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 something quantum computing I'm, i don't have the technical expertise to really evaluate that but there i think that 
although it'll be challenging, uh, social coordination, a hard fork will kind of save uh, the project. And to me, it's very important to realize that uh, while most so, so uh, if you look at complex systems, uh, you have this kind of uh, saying that any complex system that works uh, evolved, started simple, and grew big. And then any attempt to design a complex system will fail. Uh, and I think the reason why I find it so hard to find out exactly why Bitcoin will fail is because it will meet every challenge and every hurdle by evolu kind of evolution and kind of work its way around it. So uh, it'll be more of a roadblock rather than a full stop, I think. That is a, that is a, a fantastic place to end um, Bitcoin from a Darwinian view. Uh, Bitcoin is a very... One tiny little point at the end. Yeah. I'll try to be really quick. So That's you bad. had a question before this it was for me to prepare was uh, kind of the evolution of Bitcoin and how it went from kind of being uh, magic internet money uh, to kind of freedom money, both for criminals and uh, those who believed in privacy, to be a speculative asset. And I see a lot of people now cheering when Wall Street is coming in, which is a bit puzzling to me uh, as a cypherpunk uh, kind of movement. Uh, but what I think, truly think is the next step is as a universal payment instrument. And there's been two hurdles for Bitcoin to be used as a payment rail. The cost of going fiat Bitcoin and Bitcoin fiat has been too high. That's been pushed down. You can do that for a uh, sub basis point cost now. You can do it through your bank. The other has been uh, technical scaling to send a lot of transactions with liquid and the lightning. Uh, we now solve that simultaneously. And with the apps like uh, Strike in the US where you can have money in your bank account at the same time pay a lightning invoice uh, with Tesla Coil Hour solution where companies can receive a Bitcoin uh, payment either on chain or off chain, but get it automatically into the fiat of a choice. I think we'll see over the next five years an explosion in Bitcoin as a payment instrument in the back end, hidden from the end users, together with uh, the other use case as an investment asset. But yeah.